Pues estamos de regreso en semana 6. Muchas gracias a la gente que ya se está conectando a esta nueva transmisión, a este nuevo video. Si se están integrando, ya sea eh, que son parte de la comunidad UC o, o no, pues les agradezco mucho. Eh, estamos en este evento llamado Semana 6 que hacemos cada trimestre eh, desde la dirección de posgrados de la Universidad de la Comunicación y hoy por primera vez tenemos un Semana 6 internacional. Hace un momento eh, la ponencia fue desde la Universidad de Cambridge y ahora tendremos a David Lee Carson con eh, una ponencia sobre reconsiderar los métodos de investigación en los tiempos de COVID-19 desde la Universidad de Arizona, eh, que además se encuentra aquí presencialmente en la Universidad de la Comunicación lo cual nos honra muchísimo. Ahorita le, le, ya lo, lo ponemos en pantalla para que eh, podamos comenzar con, con la charla. Pero antes, bueno, primero pedirles que nos sigan en redes sociales, eh, arroba UC-oficial en Twitter, arroba Comunidad UC en Instagram, eh, Comunidad UC, eh, Universidad de la Comunicación, perdón, en Facebook y también las redes sociales de Posgrados UC para que estén al pendiente de toda la información que tenemos para ustedes, los eventos, las charlas, los talleres, eh, todos son gratuitos, así es que pueden eh, inscribirse a cualquiera de ellos. Eh, tenemos, básicamente estamos teniendo uno cada semana en, en promedio. Así es que hay muchísima información que vamos a compartir con ustedes. Y, por supuesto, agradecer a la dirección de, de posgrados, a Rebeca Cañón, a nuestro rector Salvador Corrales, eh, que a nombre de, de ellos dos les doy la, la bienvenida a esta segunda charla. Eh, y eh, pedirles también que durante la ponencia eh, dejen sus comentarios o preguntas en la caja de comentarios, ya sea en Facebook o en YouTube, en donde nos estén viendo. Esta ponencia será en inglés. Eh, sin embargo, nuestro ponente sabe español lo suficiente como para contestar sus preguntas. Y de todas maneras, yo al final de la ponencia estaré aquí conectado con, con David, con mi tocayo, eh, para leerle las preguntas y un poco pues hacer de, de eh, traductor, de intérprete. Y recordarles también para el alumnado de posgrados de la, de la Universidad de la Comunicación, Dentro de una hora tendremos un panel privado en Zoom. Eh, a través de sus grupos de WhatsApp les enviamos ya la liga para que se registren. Eh, porque, bueno, eh, estamos comenzando una alianza con la Universidad de Arizona y este panel en Zoom será justamente para iniciar estas actividades de alianza. Entonces, si no se han registrado en Zoom, les pido por favor que, que lo hagan para que estén presentes en ese panel que se llevará a cabo a las 11 de la mañana. Y bueno, y sin más, ya para que no, no le quite mucho tiempo a David, eh, pues lo presento como se merece. Eh, les repito, el título de esta ponencia es Reconsiderando los métodos de investigación en los tiempos de COVID-19, presentado por David Lee Carson. Él es profesor, déjenme les pongo aquí el, el banner. Ahí está, ah, ahora, ahora mire ya. Profesor of Quality Methods at Arizona State University. David, welcome. Gracias a ti. You can hear me? ¿Tú puedes escuchar? Sí, te escuchamos muy bien. Ok, gracias. Bueno. Um, te dejo cámaras y, y micrófonos, así es que adelante. Muchas gracias por la, por la invitación a presentar a, 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 a ustedes. Es un uh, honor uh, estar aquí. Um, pero um, hay muchas conexiones de la, um, uh, la presentación. Um, OK. There's lots of connections to the uh, uh, previous presentation, and uh, today I want to talk about, I want to present some provocations about doing research, specifically qualitative research, in the current moment, because I think that the, the COVID crisis, COVID situation presents some really interesting opportunities, but it also brings some things into crisis that I think that we should talk about. And um, I want to begin my talk today with a quick story. Um, about a week ago, when I was in Tempe, Arizona, um, I was spending time at a public swimming pool. And lucky for me, there weren't too many people there, but there was but one other person. Um, there was a woman at or about my age. She was in her 50s, and uh, we'll call her Ann. And we were both trying to enjoy uh, the sun in the middle of the day. Um, we exchanged pleasantries. And then I uh, started asking her questions. Um, as a good qualitative researcher, I always think that people have really interesting and important stories to tell. Our stories are in fact, in many ways, the most powerful things we have. Over the course of our conversation, um, it turns out that she lives in Tempe, Arizona, has a, has a friend visiting from Arkansas. Um, she's a grandma, a native Arizonan, which is rare. 
And um, she said, and I quote, the sickest person I'll ever know. Um, she disclosed to me that she's recently recovered from a second round of cancer uh, with really difficult treatment that that you know, comes with and that she was recovering from COVID-19, um, which she uh, was sure that she received from her granddaughter who had only cold-like <coughs> symptoms. I had to ask the obvious question at the time, did you receive a vaccine yet, I asked her. And she replied without missing a beat, no, I wanna get healthier first, put on more weight to deal with the side effects of the vaccine. An interesting response, I thought to myself, oh, I never thought about that. How might the vaccine affect people recovering from a combination of cancer and COVID? I just assumed that everyone should get the vaccine and still do advocate for that. But this experience raised a lot of important questions, lots of important aspects about COVID that I hadn't really thought about. And I will go into these in greater detail in this presentation but the overarching point or argument that I want to make is that the COVID-19 situation is an ontoepistemological problem. It is, some consider it a political issue, a healthcare problem, a public education failure, a public health problem, but all of these can be collapsed or kind of best understood, understood as a philosophical or a knowledge production problem. And so what I would like to do is share a PowerPoint and go through it. And then I'm going to show um, a couple videos from artists. And I want to talk about how artists can help us think methodologically, differently methodologically, to, to combat some of, the, some of the changes that we're seeing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then share a PowerPoint with you. And then I will talk through the PowerPoint as we go along. Okay. All right. So what I mean, I want to get started here. What I mean by onto epistemological problem is that COVID-19 highlights how ways of knowing and ways uh, things are informed or determined how we respond to it. Uh, does, um, the response to COVID-19 is not disinterested and comes from somewhere. The thoughts and acts, actions associated with COVID-19 emerge from multiple, dare I say, coagulated threads that have been informed by philosophical links. Here's how the story goes. If you look at this picture, you'll see that there are items classified into small little white boxes and each of them sort of separated out. And I'm using this image as a way to show what I would consider, what many consider to be sort of modernist epistemologies. Epistemology here is how do we know what we know? And how do we think we know what we can know? And so what we've done in the past or in the modernist epistemologies is we separate out, we classify, and we categorize. And let me say a little bit about that story. The beginning of the modern ways of knowing emerged through the threads that link Kant, Linnaeus, Comte, and Popper, and others. Kant specifically believed that if things were limited, they could be knowable. The positivist argued for distance and objectivist epistemology to understand objects and things in their essences. Popper reminds us to work to disprove hypotheses to constantly try to reveal negative cases, to debunk commonly held beliefs. We use this perspective and approach to understand the natural world. Obviously, from the previous slide, you can see that. There were things, uh, plants, trees, uh, pine cones, there's many objects here that were kind of separated out and distinguished. Um, we classified and categorized things according to their distinctions, resemblances, the ways that they symbol, uh, the semblances. In response, we developed similar positive fist tools to try to understand the human being. Kant's analytic told us to investigate the conditions of possibility that permeated, that created types of human being, different types of the human being that emerged. The limited aspects of the human being 
means that they could be knowable, right? The human being is limited, ergo it can be knowable. We could gather certainty about essences of the conditions of possibilities of the human being. Certainly Kant's ideas were informed by his enlightenment dreams where both rationalism and empiricism could work together to help us understand the world. A res responses to Kant's analytic of the finitude were various and, and still remain with us today. First, well, there were three, the empirical transcendental doublet, the cogito and the unknown, and the origin and the return of the original. I wanna go through each of these to talk about ways in which we've decided or thought about ways that we could understand and know the world. The empirical transcendental doublet. Um, here, humans' material reality can be reduced to some transcendental essence. Uh, we might think about how certain categories, such as man, woman, gay or straight, worker, owner, manifest in our understanding and knowing of the world. They help us, they give us categories in which to create some semblance of certainty. Um, in this respect, we think in terms of natural and knowable and common sense, so the way things have always been done. Kant talks about these a priori structures or rules or essences that sort of dictate the material, the empirical, the, 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 the matter in the world. Uh, the natural, essentialized categories that we sort of learn about as we go along and do research. Um, I'm not arguing for or advocating for such thinking. I'm just kind of tracing the history of ways in which we have looked at epistemology and tried to use it as a way of knowing the world. And we still do this. Oftentimes in, in research methodologies, we still try to get as close as we can to the transcendental. And we try to find these sort of a priori structures or rules to try to help us understand and navigate the world in which we live in. I am uh, particularly um, thinking of Jacques Derrida's work here in the Transcendental Signifier, this idea of an, an, of an all-knowing God or the, the sense of the, the all-perfect knowing self. And these, were, these were terms or these were ideas that we sort of hung our hat on as a way to, to know what was going on in the world. And this is also manifested in, in disciplines such as like psychology or like criminology. We do try to create these sort of categorical understandings of the human being. The second is the, uh, the second response to the, to the uh, analytic of the finitude, this sense of that the human being is limited so it could be knowable, is the cogito and the unknown. Here we see the relationship between what can be known or what is known in relation to the unknown. The human being is always in this place between navigating what they can know and what is not known. The mysterious, the unquantifiable, the grayness, the liminal, the in-between places. Even time and history work in this relationship. There were things in the past that have been forgotten, things in the past that were never known, and it's the same in the future, things that can't be known in the future. And so we're always navigating this world. And research is really oftentimes trying to get at the known or trying to create rules or understanding of what can be known. When we think about categorizations of the human being, specifically in, in, in disciplines like psychology, we're always looking for ways to categorize human beings as a way to create knowledge about them. Here, the unknown always exceeds the known. There are always leakages. There are always cases where people don't fit into certain categories, okay? Time and space are negotiated through the relationship between the known and the unknown. Um, it is important to know that Kant argues that we employ a priori structures to understand or put put form of the unknown based in the transcendental. We do try to understand these a priori rules um, as if life were that simple, but it's not, we know. Life is messy, life is complicated, life is very dynamic. And human beings are complicated, messy, and, and irrational. 
Nonetheless, I also think that it's here where COVID-19 has generated the most intense crisis. But if you're going to, and if you're going to spend time med meditating on the onto-epistemological situation of the COVID-19, we want to spend our time here because we're constantly navigating this unknown. But more on this topic later. And then the third response to the analytic of the finitude is uh, the relationship between the origin and the return of the origin. As a way of knowing the human, we turn to the quest for the origin. It is as if we think that if an origin can be found, we can locate a cause and then solve whatever problem we have. Origin, as we know, often lead to more questions. And in the perspective of Michel Foucault, they're often historically contingent. Origins are all, almost always never ending and known. And there are many origins that remain possible. A return to the past and the present gets revealed in themselves that origin can come back. But it, is, it can't be completely predicted and it can't be completely known in advance. Origins reveal causes but can never fully reveal the cause of something in its totality. It's an impossibility. Okay. It is important to locate spots or moments of emergences instead of the origin and to be careful and even skeptical of claims of an origin. Many causes exist and many or origins remain possible. So let's return to our sunny day by the pool. Um, what's interesting about Anne's response to me it reveals quite a bit about the onto epistemological crisis of COVID-19, which has huge implications for research methods. I wanna say that oftentimes when we're investigating such you know, social phenomena, such as like COVID-19, we do find ourselves within these, one of those, these three double, doubles, the empirical transcendental, the, the cogito and the unknown, and then the origin. We're looking for origins, we're looking for the complications and trying to make things knowable and certain. And we are looking for these sort of a priori rules to understand human behavior within a social context. There are a couple things I wanna talk about um, in terms of this and in terms of Anne. What struck me about our conversation is it made me question the knowledge of the body. The body that's ever changing, it's dynamic, it's an unknowable, it can't be fully known organism, it's an ecology. But with so much certainty, she said to me, I wanna wait until I get healthier before I get a vaccine, which seemed contradictory, right? If you get the vaccine, you'll be healthier, I thought. But that type of sense seems reasonable enough, but in reality, there's always enough unknowable to uh, understand where taking a vaccine could be unhealthy in some cases. There's always a situation in some cases that always kind of keeps us honest about our own ideas about these things. Um, although I have a body and feel knowledgeable about it because I've lived in it for 52 years, there's so much about it that I don't know and more important, who am I to talk, you know, to dictate how someone else, what they should do with their own bodies. In fact, although there is quite a bit we know about the health of the human body, the body in many respects remains a very unexplored territory. Research on nutrition, for example, is really controversial, and even research on some cancers remains speculative. The body exists between the known and the unknown doublet. We're always negotiating that relationship. How, are, how one knows or comes to know one's body as well as reconciles the unknowable aspects of the body says a lot potentially about how one's, one responds to COVID-19. In the modernist epistemology where we categorize and group things together in nice, nice, nice neat little boxes, um, you, um, in order to stabilize and make certain our understanding of the world, it's very, it's a very complicated, the body becomes a very complicated entity because not everything can be categorized. And sometimes categorization or specialization can be very deleterious and very damaging and even unhealthy, right? Um, the other aspect that's important to me is, um, um, I thought to myself, 
and to Anne's response is that she's clearly misinformed. The notion of disinformation or the misuse or misappropriation of information intended to give false or misleading information is a real phenomenon in the US. Um, and I think um, perhaps less so here in Mexico, um, but I'm not sure. And I don't support or condone or endorse, but I want to complicate it a little bit and think about this. What was important for me to notice was how quickly I meant, went to that place, that she's misinformed. She's not getting the right information, right? And it's as if I want language or I think that language and knowledge is completely transparent, right? And does exactly what I want it to do. And language doesn't work that way. Language can work that way, but it doesn't always work that way. And it's actually very rare when it does. Language is not transparent. And here again, I'm thinking of the work of Jacques Derrida and others. Language doesn't behave when we communicate and when we, um, when we speak about these things, when we speak about things of the body and things of health and things of you know, disease and pandemics, language doesn't always behave. And, and reason and rationalism doesn't always work as well as we see. In fact, quite the contrary, we find that reason and rational, rationality disseminate. There are multiple rationalities that people use to make sense of the world, make sense of their own conditions, make sense of their own bodies, and make sense of their own social world. And in my view, and I'll get to this a little bit later, language doesn't deserve that much responsibility. We put so much emphasis in language and communication that I'm not sure that it should be given that much responsibility. You know, in many ways, it is what we have when we communicate research, but I'm not so sure that I think we might give it too much responsibility. Um, and materiality exists. I want to say that, that materiality exists, reality persists. COVID exists. It has killed close to 670,000 people alone in the US and millions worldwide. And people continue to get infected and die from it. You know. Also, we have really solid, even inconclusive evidence that vaccines work. What that means is that vaccines, while can't necessarily prevent everyone from getting COVID, it can ameliorate the systems and long-term effects of COVID and you know, save your, potentially save your life for the most part. The evidence suggests that generally speaking, vaccines work. So why the refusal to get a vaccine? What is driving the anti-vax movement? It seems the question about understanding, about knowledge, body, language exists how we understand how we come to know the effects of the response of the vaccine, mythical religious beliefs, along with skepticism of medicine, along with some conservative beliefs um, or anti-government ideologies present certain ways of knowing the body and understanding information about COVID. So there's no, like, there's no way we can sort of hang our hat on rationalism and reason because there's multiple reasons that are getting used and different ways in which people make sense of the, of the world and, and of COVID itself. Processing information is not a uniform endeavor. Language defies and misbehaves. Language is an unreliable, oftentimes an unreliable conveyor of information. Um, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and its subsequent response in many ways represents the limits of rationalism, and more importantly reflects a dissemination of various um, rationalities, some that seem nonsensical, even chimerical. But nonetheless, the idea that reason or rationalities is one thing or one operation that straightens language out, makes it behave, is also problematic. The COVID-19 pandemic also reveals a crisis of the expert, um, who can be the expert? The way of knowing in the various forums can lead to experts being under constant scrutiny and be, and be doubted. To be sure, social media as a medium to complicate this situation further has um, exacerbated the problem, the, dis the dissemination of the expert even tainted the concept of the expert. The expert is no longer the person with special knowledge built on years of study and experience. 
but it seems to me as someone who can convince others that in contrast to someone else, they can declare themselves an expert. Expertise is about personality, about celebrity, and about affect, and about convincing others that the other person shouldn't be listened to. Who has access to knowledge is less important than convincing others how to understand and interpret information. There is no other way to explain the kind of anti-Fauci movement in the US. And now I wanna show a quick video because I want to complicate this idea of the expert. And I want to think about ways that we can use the media in the, the COVID-19 crisis to deal with this issue related to the multiplicities of rationalities that seems to be going on. So just give me one second here to, to get a, get a, um, to line up the video. It's a short video. I want to give you some name about getting ready in the morning. Mom, you name. Then we Then your hand we divide. And now you're ready for the day. Super. Okay, so what I want to do in that particular video is to talk about the, the ways in which, the, the, if we're going to complicate the notion of the expert, then the people who can become the, the best experts are the people who've been through the health crisis or the problem, uh, the health situation. They, they take out the celebrity. They, they, in fact, play on the idea of affect, and they talk about the real world challenges that people face when they have, say, long-term COVID or when they suffer from COVID. And actually, we see quite a bit of this going on in, on like uh, TikTok. People are showing videos from hospital rooms and that kind of information. In the past, that kind of advertising, that kind of social media campaigning has been, in many respects, credited for the decreasing in, in smoking um, in the US particularly. But it can't be just that approach. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. As I, as I said earlier, we can't rely just on reason and we can't rely just on information, say from the CDC. We have to rely on multiple aspects of, of, the, of COVID and the way in which it gets interpreted in the body and the way in which um, we harness and use research in social media um, is, is in my view, the best, best approach to, to combat. Um, some of these some of these trends. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint and just give me one, one quick um, share screen. Okay. Okay, um, and this leads nicely to my kind of final point before I move on to um, artists. Um, the final point about Anne is that so much that goes on with the body and the health is a calculation of risk. And we saw this in the previous presentation. There was a really robust discussion about risk. Chance, what are the chances I get COVID if I get it? What are the chances I get put in the hospital or die from it? The debates around COVID about were you know abound, and all um, and many we all know people who defied the odds, while other who were healthy didn't. Medicine, vaccines, body knowledge production is predicated on levels of one's understanding of risk, and that is a complicated question. For some, taking a vaccine posed a greater risk than. Uh, possibly getting COVID, while to others such logic was lunacy. Rationalities just kept proliferating. We have to think about the role that chance and risk play in the production of knowledge. Knowledge and knowing is always fraught with a perhaps, 
there's always a perhaps. Knowing is a perhaps. Um, for medicine, to social sciences, to marketing, to, we all research, all of us who do research, we all research in the unknown, in the gray, in the liminal, liminal in, the, in between. We will have to become comfortable with the non-categorical, with the mysterious, and the private, hidden, and the disconfirming cases. So what do we do in terms of research methodologies? Here are some provocations. And what I want to do is I want to talk about three, four different artists that I think can help us to think differently about the role that qualitative research in particular can, can, um, can engage in. And really my critique is around modernist epistemologies. And I really think that in many ways we have to leave the threads or the residue of those epistemologies behind in order to even think about how we can research in, in an era of COVID-19. And I, I recently read an article um, from The Atlantic where it talks about how COVID-19 isn't gonna go away, but it does become more manageable. And I think it's important for us to use this moment, this COVID-19 crisis of rationalities, of, of expert, celebrity, knowledge, et cetera, to think about ways that we can get rid of the, the sort of the, the modernist epistemologies of categorizing, of grouping, of um, creating uh, certain types of human beings and kind of redesign what we think, um, redesign research methodologies to combat really complex problems. And not just being all or nothing, like those who get the vaccine are better than those who don't. We can't think that way. We have to think about the complications and the sort of dynamic aspects of, of doing research in this particular setting. So the first thing we have to do, in my view, is to create another way in which um, the life that we live is not boxes, but is more fluid. It is more of a, of a relational. And so I'm gonna show a quick video of a dance to, to sort of exemplify what I mean um, by this. So just bear with me real quick here. Um, Thank you. 
the many things about this dance that I think are really important. And one of them is that there's, everything is responding to something else. And I think that also the space is demarcated. And so we are in a community. So there's a sort of communitarian ethic that I think is really important, even though there are diverse movements. And the movements are not sort of straight laced. They're not sort of uh, regimented or disciplined. I mean, there could be discipline, but they're, they're moving in very different ways. And so how do we think about doing research and thinking about the world when there's so much multiplicity of movement, when things are constantly in motion, when life is in motion? And I think we have to think about those kind of complications and that sort of dynamic aspects of the body and bodies moving, colliding, coagulating together when we think about doing research in terms of you know, situations like in COVID, with COVID-19. The second example is from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a botanist, but she's an indigenous scholar at the SUNY, in SUNY at, at State University of New York. And we're gonna listen just a brief clip from her about um, in an interview that she gave uh, a while back. And if you have a chance, uh, get a, read her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. It's, it's absolutely marvelous because she privileges the world of plants and trees. So there is no like centering of the human being in her work. It's always seen from the perspective of coming from what we can learn from plants and trees and, and things that are around us. And that's another really important distinction from the modernist epistemology where there was this, like a human centered emphasis. And we've been living in that for many, many years and I think it's important to try to get outside of that. So for example, when we think about COVID-19, instead of thinking as, of the virus as an, as an enemy or as something non-human, in, in Robin uh, Wall, Wall Kimmerer's perspective, we might think of what we can learn from viruses in general. How might the virus, what, what might it teach us about life and about things that are animate? What happens if we make the virus uh, more animate. And I, I think that that might be kind of an interesting or a fruitful discussion to have. But let's listen to her uh, interview that I have sort of keyed up here. And it's, it's not very long. Oopsie. I think we have an advertisement. Haz crecer tu negocio con Workana. Encuentra el talento independiente que... Claro que sí, hombre con exceso de cafeína. Algún desarrollador y con... Okay. To a more traditional... So she's being interviewed by Krista Tippett, I think, is on the On Being project. Sorry. You did work for a time at Bausch and Lomb after college. I mean, you went into a more traditional scientific endeavor. I wonder, was there kind of a turning point, a day or a moment where where you felt compelled to bring these things together in the way you could, these different ways of knowing and seeing and studying the world? Yes, I think the place that it became most important to me to start to bring these ways back of knowing back together again is when, as a, a young PhD botanist, I was invited to a gathering of traditional plant knowledge holders. And I was just there to listen. And it was such an amazing experience. Four days of listening to people whose knowledge of the plant world was so much deeper. And these were, were these elders or these indigenous or indigenous they teachers? They were. Okay. Their education was on the land and with the plants and through the oral tradition. But I just sat there and soaked in this wonderful conversation, which interwove mythic knowledge and scientific knowledge into this beautiful cultural natural history. And for me, it was absolutely a watershed moment because it made me remember those things that starting to walk the science path had made me forget or attempted to make me forget and i just saw that their knowledge was so much more whole and rich 
and 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 um, nurturing that I wanted to do everything that I could to bring those ways of knowing back into harmony. You you said one at one point that you had gotten to the point where you're talking about the names of plants, right? I was teaching the names and ignoring the songs. <laughs> so what what do you mean by that? One of the difficulties of moving in the scientific world is that when we name something, often with a scientific name, right, this name becomes almost an end to inquiry. We sort of say, well, we know it now. We're able to systematize it and put a, a Latin binomial on it. So it's ours. We know what we need to know. But that is only looking, of course, at the morphology of the organism, at the way that it looks. It, it ignores all of its relationships. It, it's, it's such a mechanical, kind of wooden representation yeah. of, of what a plant really is. And we reduce them tremendously if we just think about them as, as physical elements of the ecosystem. So one of the things I love about her work is that she doesn't dismiss you know, scientific or rationalism or modernist epistemologies, but they become part of, they become one aspect of knowing the world. And there's a really, really important word that she talks about here is that it's, we want to see them in their relationality to other things. And that makes learning and research more complicated but as she says, she talks about it being more rich. Um, and she talks about the mythic and the science were interwoven to create this sort of cultural history. And I think, you know, we want to get to that. We want to move to that, that sort of artistic. She talks about, uh, her, one of her advisors told her that if she wanted, her main question for her research is, why is the world so beautiful? And when she went to graduate school, her advisor told her, if you want to study beauty, you should go to art school. That is not a scientific question. But I think it is. And I think we need to ask more questions that sort of merge the scientific, merge the scientific with the aesthetic or with other properties, other matters, um, to try to understand the sort of dynamic relationship. It also decenters the human, right? And it makes the human more of an more of a, an, a curious and inquisitor, somebody who's asking plant life, other kinds of life uh, for, for knowledge um, and thinking about other ways of knowing. Um, I also think that she's really important in terms of thinking about the animacy of the earth and the life of the, the properties, the, the way in which um, plants and other bodily or biopolitical aspects have an animacy to them. And I think that's a, that's a really important um, aspect to ways in which we can think about doing research. Because of time, I'm going to do one more. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> People looking at me. Um, but I'm going to show, um, I, I have several, so if you want any more information about this, I'll be another artist that I really love um, is Berile Baez. So I'm going to show her quick video and then I'll talk about it and then I'll wrap up. But each of these author, each of these artists give us different ways to access research and think about research and definitely the articulation of research in multiple and in different ways. Uh, I'm not sure why she she's not loading. In most power relationships you have the victim trying to solve the situation. And I don't want to create narratives of victimhood. I want to flip it. The freedom that I offer in each painting is in the mutable body. In having bodies in constant transition, 
it leaves it open for the viewer to shift ideas of power in that process you shift the world around you that's where beauty can be subversive If it were up to me, I'd be a hermit in some mountain seascape. And I have my giant space with open windows and f if rain comes in. That's the dream. But I remember always making, from the time I was like six, other kids would have me draw out these very fancy mariquitas for them. And I would have these like elaborate ball gowns and they would always have very intricate hair. I was always dealing with the body. My earliest childhood was in Loma de Cabrera, which is right at the border of Dominican Republic and Haiti. Should you go straight out from that southeast end of Cuba, you will come next to the second largest island of the Romantic Archipelago. We will make all these assumptions of what it is to be someone from the Caribbean. And when you fall outside that, then you can get something better. One of the first reasons I wanted to work on these paintings was looking at some of the first scientific illustration of flora and fauna from the New World, looking at Carl Linnaeus. Here's this guy who was the foundation of modern scientific methods of observation and categorization. But so much of his work was sheer nonsense. It equated the New World black and brown body with bestiality. In telling of what the New World people were, you'd be next to cannibals and vampires. So leaning into their already fallible vision and making something new. In reading my paintings of Siguapas, I'm asking the viewer, to come to terms with their own feelings around a woman's body. The Siguapa is this trickster figure. She's a seductress. Someone will be lured by her and then be completely lost and never seen again. The description is so ambiguous. It could be anything from like a mongoose to the most beautiful woman to the most ugly woman. The only certain thing is that her legs are backwards. Maybe followed their footsteps, you were going in the wrong direction. And that she has this lustrous mane of hair. She was meant to be something that made us so fearful that we could be quiet for long enough to be groomed into civility. <laughs> The normative tone of the story is these are wanton female creatures, they're hypersexual and they derail culture. And the under story is they're highly independent, they're self-possessed, and they feel deeply. So who wouldn't want to be that? What was exciting in using that image was to be able to incorporate all those things that were labeled object, that were seen as unwanted, and reframe them as something beautiful and with an eye of desire. I 
I recently went to one of my aunts and she was like, you know, I never would have thought you would be an artist. And she's the one who was kind of raising us when I was about seven. And I think for her, she just saw it as like um, a little bit of troublemaking. Because I'd be the one trying to sew paper together and getting my finger stuck in the needle. <laughs> like sewing right through my finger. But I was just like, I'm going to bind my book. It's going to be the thing. I'm going to make it perfect. They did call me, I don't know if it was the demolisher or the hellion. <laughs> Whenever I imagine a painter, it's someone who's very composed, kind of like a lady painter. But I feel like a car mechanic. My mom is a master seamstress. She can make really beautiful things. But she was so caught up in 100 hour work week that she always does things for their function. It makes for a lot of precarity. So none of the things that you build tend to last. So I'm trying to break that cycle and teach my nephews and nieces to think of themselves as part of longer cycles behind them and long cycles before them. And that every choice that we make is predicated by the people we hope to love in the future and the people we love in the past. I get so much inspiration from this, from her work. It's just incredible for me. But in terms of research methodologies, I want to talk about leaning. She talks about the, the, the Linnaeus's racist views of, of the New World people. And she says, you know, instead of being in opposition to them, she says, like, lean into their already fallible vision and make something new. And I think that's a very productive and even sort of a fruitful um, message. Uh, for research methodologists to not kind of everybody go into their own little corners and then start shouting at each other, but to lean into the already fallible vision and make something new out of that. I think that is really potentially very productive. And then she talks about the unwanted reframed as beautiful with an eye of desire. I think that's also another one. But I love this, um, the idea of the understory. What's the understory? What's another way to, to understand or, and to interpret that? And then finally, the last thing she says is choices we make predicated on people we love in the future and from those in the past. And I think that's also very powerful. That it's not so much being fearful of the unknown, but using this as a way to motivate and to think about the work that we're doing as choices from those in the past and those potentially in the future. And so I'm going to wrap up. There's so much more that I could say. I could talk about this topic for a very long time. Um, but I just, just basically want to thank you for inviting me to present my work on this and some ideas that I have about this. And I'm uh, really excited to hear what everyone has to say and what everyone has to share. Thank you. David, thank you. David, thank you. Thank you. That is because we're in the same place, like a <laughs> jack of distance. We have a, a question here from Maria. Do you agree that viewing and listening the testimony of truth of other people and its relation with experience with our sense is how we actually open our mind to see the big picture? Uh, that's A different way in a way that maybe wasn't intended um, and so like for example certain experiences um, can seemingly be obvious can seemingly obvious obviously evoke a sense of sympathy but sometimes they don't and they can be used as um, uh, they can be weaponized to produce the opposite 
So it's not a foolproof way to open the mind to see the big picture, but it can be a very powerful way for sure. Can, can you repeat the first part of your answer because they didn't hear? Yeah, I think it can be a very powerful thing. Power, testimony can be very powerful. Um, I, I think sharing one's story can be, can be a very powerful approach to, to open our minds, but I don't, just to kind of summarize, I don't know that it can be the only way because sometimes it, those stories can be, can be misinterpreted or, or, or viewed as a, as, a, as a way to weaponize another position or another approach. But yes, they can be very powerful for sure. Thank you. See, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, uh, for your presentation. It was very uh, helpful for us. Eh, muchas gracias también a toda la gente que se conectó eh, a través de las redes sociales de la Universidad de la Comunicación en el Facebook de Posgrado C y en el canal de YouTube de la Universidad de la Comunicación. Muchas gracias, eh, David, otra vez. Y, pues bueno, hago entrega simbólica de tu constancia. <ríe> Le están aplaudiendo aquí en backstage <ríe> por esta conferencia eh, Reconsidering Research Methods in the Time of COVID-19. Muchas, muchas gracias. Y eh, nos vemos en Zoom en dos minutos. <ríe> muchas gracias a toda la gente que estuvo aquí en eh, estas transmisiones de semana 6. Eh, el evento sigue ahora de manera privada para la comunidad eh, de posgrados UC. Eh, justo está aquí apareciendo el, el, eh, el banner en sus pantallas. Eh, para toda la comunidad de docentes y alumnado de, de posgrados UC, les esperamos ahora mismo en Zoom. El link de registro lo tienen ya en sus grupos de WhatsApp desde hace unos días. De todas maneras, si alguien no lo encuentra, nos puede escribir en sus grupos y se los volvemos a enviar para que lo tengan a la mano porque justo el día de hoy aquí con David estamos iniciando una alianza entre la comunidad UC y la comunidad de la Universidad de Arizona. Así es que, pues, muchas gracias a la gente que nos vio. Eh, quienes no forman parte de la comunidad UC, por favor, síganos en redes sociales, posgrados UC, eh, eh, UC Radio, eh, perdón, ya, ya me, me fui con mi, con mi trabajo habitual, eh, UC guión bajo oficial en Twitter, eh, arroba comunidad UC en Instagram y, por supuesto, la página de Facebook, eh, Universidad de la Comunicación para que estén al pendiente de toda la información que tenemos para ustedes, toda la oferta académica y todos los eventos que hacemos de manera gratuita eh, alrededor, ¿no? Todo, todos estos eventos satelitales de la eh, actividad académica que tenemos en la universidad. Muchas gracias. Nos vemos en la próxima semana 6, que eh, ya estamos planeando desde ahora, ¿verdad, Rebeca? <ríe> a nombre de Rebeca Cañón, directora de posgrados, y a nombre de nuestro rector Salvador Corrales Ayala, les doy las gracias por conectarse y nos vemos en tres meses, en semana 6, en, eh, 2022, ¿no? No, todavía 21. ¿Todavía 21? Sí, sí. Ok, entonces, invierno, semana 6, invierno. <risa> <risa> Yo soy Davo Herrera, cuídense mucho, nos vemos la próxima.